Good morning, everyone. You're all very good students. You're all early. Thank you. Good morning from Malaysia. Good morning, I can see also from Russia and Ukraine and from the UAE, South Korea. Very nice. Very nice to see so many of you here. Good morning to you, Ahmed in Egypt and Ben, you in Saudi Arabia. Very nice. What I'm going to ask you to do for the time being is to mute your microphone and I'll let you know later when I'd like you to unmute the microphone because I'm going to be setting a number of exercises and questions during the lesson. I leave it up to each of you whether you want to leave your cameras switched on because in a moment I'm going to share my screen and when I do you will see each other or those of you who have the cameras switched on. If you're happy with that, that's great. If you're not happy for the public to see you, then switch the cameras off. While I'm speaking, only my face will appear. Whoever speaks, their face appears. I'm going to start the lesson now, which means I'm going to switch off the camera and bring up a presentation, the first of the presentations. But before I do, let me first of all begin this course. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name's Richard Brady. I'm the head of the British Legal Centre. We're a training company for lawyers and for people involved in the law, such as engineers who draft fitted construction contracts or business managers who draft import and export contracts. Basically, we train lawyers around the world. We train judges as well, but mostly we train lawyers. We do this through online broadcasts like this, through selling our recorded live courses, and also through live training events, which we run in different countries. Now, the reason I'm not at home at the moment is because I was running a training course in Dubai when they closed the airport. And now I'm locked in Dubai for the next three or four weeks. And whilst it's great to enjoy the sunshine, unfortunately, I'm not allowed out of my hotel apartment for more than 15 minutes a day to go to the supermarket. And when I do, I have to wear a face mask and gloves. So during this difficult period of the coronavirus, to keep all of you engaged and stop you being bored as I am in my hotel room, we're going to run this course of Legal English. What we're going to do is we're going to take parts of the Legal English course, the Legal Writing course, the Contract Drafting course, and the Contract Law course. I'm not going to run all four courses, but I'm going to run parts of each course as combination in combination with this course. We're going to begin, in fact, with something from the legal writing course, which also appears in the contract drafting course. So what I'm going to do now, because we're having terrible trouble in trying to control all the participants who are joining with their microphones switched on, I'm going to switch off my camera, share my screen, and bring up the first presentation and talk you through it. Okay, now we're going to begin a course of general legal English. So what is legal English? Well, legal English is the strange style of English used by lawyers. Just as English is the language of international business, so legal English is the language of international law. Unfortunately, it's not ordinary English. It's English which has been affected by the input of the Romans and the Latin, which they put into English law, the Anglo-Saxons, the Angles and the Saxons, the invading German tribes that moved into England in the 8th and 9th centuries, the Normans, the Viking French who conquered England in the 11th century, and also the input of grammar from the Vikings, the Danes, and the Jutes from that part of Germany, their language, their different grammatical traditions are all incorporated in legal English. So it's not ordinary English. It also includes a lot of old English words that no ordinary native speaker of English would understand. Taught visa, bailment, as well as words like lease, from Norman French, 
vice versa, etc. from Latin. And use of Old English such as deem, by virtue of. These words are not used by ordinary native speakers of English. And so it's only people who've been trained in them, really, that can deal with general, international, legal English. We're going to address a lot of these topics in this course. And to be honest, I don't know how long this course is going to last for. It's going to last for at least a month and maybe longer. I don't know how long we're going to be locked down in this coronavirus situation. But we will broadcast two lessons each week. We will record each lesson as we're doing now. And we will paste the links to the recordings on the website. So even if you miss a lesson or you want to watch it again, you'll be able to go to the link and use that link to watch the recording. Now, the next thing is this. We can broadcast this lesson to 10 people or we can broadcast it to 500 people. I don't really mind how many people participate. So if you enjoy the lesson, please tell your colleagues. I'd like to see how many people the system can support. At the moment, we've got about 100 participants. I'd like to see if we can raise it to three or 400 <laughs> later in the course. Right, let's begin the course. So this first part of the lesson is taken from our legal writing course. This consists of 60 short videos, the recorded version, of 60 different topics. We can't deal with every topic in this course, but I'm going to deal with some of them. And the most important of all is, first of all, making your writing easy to understand. Now, the way in which we do this is to write in the active voice and also to keep our sentences short and to avoid old-fashioned legalese old-fashioned legal writing. So, I want you to remember these five principles to keep all of your writing, whether it's business writing, legal writing, or just ordinary conversation with other businesses or making complaints to hotels. First, keep your sentences short, 20 words or less. I know that sounds difficult for lawyers, but you will find that the journalists at the Times newspapers in London are told to keep their sentences to 16 words or below because shorter sentences are easier to understand. Second, very main and important rule, don't use old-fashioned legal jargon. It might be very impressive to say here with, there with, where by, here by, there by, but it confuses the reader because nobody understands what it means. In fact, as a qualified English lawyer, I can tell you, I've been qualified 10 years before anybody explained the difference between hereby, thereby, and whereby. Don't use it. It confuses the reader. The whole purpose of legal writing is to communicate, communicate ideas, concepts, information to the reader with the greatest possible ease. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to write using the active voice. This is the grammar sequence of the subject, the thing or person doing something, followed by the main verb, which is what they're doing, and followed by the rest of the information, which usually includes who or what they are doing it to. So nine sentences out of ten use the active voice rather than the passive. We'll come on to the passive later in this course. Now, when you've got a sentence which has just got too much information in it, so it's difficult for the reader's brain to take in, break it up using bullet points. Break it up into bite-sized segments of information. And lastly, many lawyers don't like writing with verbs. They use the noun for the process rather than the verb. Lawyers don't pay money. They make payments. They don't introduce people. They arrange for an introduction to be made. They don't complete a matter, they achieve completion of the matter. While it sounds very pompous, it needs far more words and it's difficult to understand. Let's move on. Now, as this is the beginning of the course, we're going to start off with a kind of a joke. I want you to imagine this situation. Somebody's walked into your office and asked you to explain a document to them because they've been asked to sign it, but they do not understand it. Let's have a look at the document. 
here it is. Well, I'm going to let you read this for yourselves for a minute just to take in how dreadful it is. It's a typically badly written document in old fashioned legalese designed to impress the client rather than to inform. Fooled with old fashioned English, I hereby give my agent. Second line, whatsoever. Third line, hereafter. Property. Well, we understand what property is, real or personal. Would non-lawyers understand that real property means land? Personal property means anything else? And look at the bottom line. Power of attorney. That's what it is. And this phrase in front of it, by virtue of. What does that mean? Well, there's two reasons why the client can't understand this. The first is too much use of old-fashioned English. And the second reason is the sentences are too long. Let's have a look at the use of this old-fashioned English. I hereby give my agent the power to. Well, would it make any difference if I just wrote, I give my agent the power to? Wouldn't really make any difference, would it? This hereby, herewith, it's really very old-fashioned, and I'll explain the meaning of it in a later lesson. Let's get rid of it. Let's find all these old words. There they are, highlighted in red. Whatsoever, hereby, herein, by virtue of. Let's get rid of it. There. Well, I've improved it a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. But the sentences are still far too long. Why are they too long? Well, they've got too many words in them. Why have they got too many words in them? Well, contract drafters, bad styling mistake. We're human beings. Our natural inclination when we try to explain something is to over explain. If I want to explain a point to you, I'll tell you what it is and then look at you. And if I don't think you've understood, I'll explain a bit more in the hope I can make it easy for you. And lawyers, when they draft a contract or a document, often they put down a rule, and then rather than just leaving the rule, they then try to add every single circumstance when it applies. Right, so I'm giving my agent the power to perform any act. But I've over explained, it's to exercise or perform. Well, which is it? This style of writing came in with the Norman Conquest in 1066 AD. It's 954 years old this year. Choose one word, not both. Don't carry out exercise or perform. Don't stop, cease or desist. Do one of them. Choose one word, which means what you say. And some advice from Mark Twain, the American writer. Never use a complicated word when a simple word will do. That's very good advice for lawyers if they want to be understood. So what's the simplest word here? Exercise or perform or do. I give my pay agent the power to do any, and then now we're trying to over-specify what they're entitled to do. They're to do any act, power, duty, or right, or obligation that I have or may acquire relating to any person, matter, transaction, or property, real or personal, tangible or intangible. Oh, my goodness. Too much detail. It's not making it clear, it's making it complicated. I give my agent the power to do any what? Well, to do anything that I have a right to do. Now, that's the simplest and the most and widest power you could ever give anybody, isn't it? I can't give you the right I can't give you any more rights. I can only give you the rights to do things that I've got a right to do. So, in that case, what's the point in giving examples? If I gave you examples of everything I have a right to do, we'd be here all week. Unless there's a very specific example, it's very, very important that you mention the example, don't bother. The power to borrow money, the power to buy land. Well, that's fine. But I also happen to have the power to stay in bed on Saturday morning, the power to buy a pizza on Friday night, the power to take a holiday once a year, provided they let me out of this hotel. What's the point in giving examples? Unless it's an exception, usually don't bother to mention it. 
Only bother to mention examples if they're really, really important. So let's get rid of them. Right. Now, the second sentence. Let's have a look at it. Well, before we do, let me explain a rule of contract interpretation in the common law jurisdictions. It's the doctrine of contra preferentum. Of course, that's Latin. Contra means against. Preferentum means to be preferred against. In other words, anybody that writes something into a document will have it strictly interpreted against their interests. So if you're trying to put an exclusion clause into a contract, you must be very, very specific as to what it is you're trying to exclude. Otherwise, the common law courts will say it's too wide, we will not apply it. And the second rule of contra preferentum is this. Anybody that writes something into a document which is ambiguous or contradicts something which is already in the document will be punished by the court for creating confusion by the court deliberately taking the meaning that was not intended. Now, English is a very nuanced language. There are over 350,000 words. Best to take the time to think of the exact word you mean rather than taking an inexact word and amending it with an adverb or an adjective. So, very difficult in a document to express the same idea using a different set of words if you've already expressed the idea once. Let's have a look at this second sentence. I grant to my agent full power and authority to anything necessary in exercising any of the powers as fully as I might or could do if personally present with full power of substitution or revocation, ratification, and confirming all that my agent will lawfully do or cause to be done in accordance with his power of attorney. Well, it sounds to me like they're trying to express the same idea as the first sentence using a different set of words. If you do try and express the idea a second time, you can only do it one of two ways. You either repeat exactly the same words, which is a waste of time because you've already said it once, or you use a different set and you might create some sort of ambiguity or confusion, which is exactly what this second sentence is doing. So let's get rid of this second sentence. So the client walked into your office and said, what does this document mean? Well, Mr. Client, what it means is, I give my agent the power to do anything I have a right to do now or in the future. Now, clearly, you can't write this down on a piece of paper and put it in front of a client and say, sign this, it's a power of attorney. The client will say, I'm not signing that. I could have written it myself. Or worse, if you're in private practice, I'm not paying for that. I could have written it myself. But my point is, you don't need to write all this old-fashioned English, hereby giving your agent power to exercise or perform. You don't need to write all that to express a simple legal idea. It's very straightforward, okay? Keep it simple. If it's simple, it will be understood. If it can be understood, it will be complied with. So here's a little exercise for you. Here are some sentences from just plain, from letters, written to clients or written between colleagues. Some of them have spelling mistakes. Some of them have too many words. Some of them are over polite. Let's have a look at this first one. It's over polite, it's full of low, old fashioned English. Pursuant to your instructions, I met with Roger Smith today regarding the above referenced cause. What? What on earth are you talking about? I want you to go to your chat box and I want you to rewrite that in plain English in as few words as possible. Now, don't write like lawyers. I know that's difficult. I want you to write like human beings. Just rewrite that first sentence for me in the chat box and we'll examine your answers in a minute, okay? Okay, now, I, <laughs> we've got 95 participants. So far, nobody's given me an answer. I know you know how to use the chat box. Ah, oh, here they come in. Ah, oh, they're coming in. Great, that's it. Anybody else going to answer anything? Well, we've got 20 answers. Let's have a look at some of them, shall we? Uh, I've met Roger Smith, as you instructed. That's great, Malik Alfie. 
Amma, I met with Roger Smith to discuss the topic with him. That's good as well, Amma. Alena, as you told me, I met with Roger Smith to discuss this matter. That's great. Uh, watch, your, watch your spelling there a little, Yelena. I met Roger Smith to follow your instructions. Not quite Maldell, but better than the original. PMT, as, your, as per your instruction, I met Roger Smith today. That's great, PMT. Okay, that's great. Well, the point is, pursuant is such old-fashioned English, we don't want to use it. According to, or following your instructions. I met Roger Smith today. Regarding the above-referenced cause means, the above-referenced cause means a reference to a case. So, following your instructions, I met Roger Smith today regarding this matter, or regarding this case. Right, simple as that. Now, number two is overly polite. It's nice to write like this, but nobody's got time to read it. Please be advised. Goodness me. Discovery is part of legal procedure where you're allowed to ask the other side in a contested legal case what evidence they've got. That's what we call discovery. The court gives a time limit for you to ask these questions. And when they stop that time limit, that's the cutoff date. So, please be advised that the discovery cutoff in the above reference cause is Monday, 20th March 2000. Right. Can you rewrite that for me nice and quick? Just plain, polite English. No need to write like lawyers. Write like human beings. Non-lawyers, if you like. Write like ordinary members of the public. Let's see what answers we've got. 22. Okay. Let's have a look at some of these answers. Okay. Note that. Very good, Guyi san. Very good. Aliena, please note the deadline for discovery cutoff is Monday. Okay. Yeah, good, Aliena. Mahmoud, what was that? Discovery cutoff. Where he is. Oh, excellent. Excellent, Mahmoud. Polite, but exactly to the point. Let's have a look at Mahmoud's answer. The discovery deadline is Monday, March 20th, 2000. Absolutely right. Very good. Short to the point. Nobody can object. I get letters saying, dear and most esteemed, honoured sir, please note, I don't need to be written to like this. Nobody does. Please note, the discovery deadline or the discovery, please note, I'm sure they're going to note it. Let's just tell them. The discovery deadline is Monday, 20th March, 2000. Very good, Mahmoud. Very good. Okay, let's move on. I won't go through all of these. Try as home tasks yourselves. Now, let's... Let's go now to the legal writing course. This is the most important thing we're going to tell you today. Probably the most important thing of the whole course, no matter how many lessons we have. You will have noticed that I am a native speaker of English. We native speakers use the active voice 90% of the time. It's the easiest way of explaining your messages. It allows you to write short sentences using a standard grammar pattern so that you won't make grammar mistakes in your writing. Nine sentences out of 10, use the active voice. Now, here's a fairly simple legal sentence. The court decision will depend upon the judge's interpretation of clause four of the contract. Now note the order of the parts of that sentence. The court decision, that's the subject, will depend, that's the verb, Subject, verb, and then what? Well, the rest of the information containing the object. Upon the judge's interpretation, that's the object. Judge's interpretation of what? The rest of the information comes after the subject, verb, object. So it's the judge's interpretation of clause four of the contract. Now that's a very simple sentence, but it's written in the active voice and it's very simple to understand. The reason we use the active voice is because if we tell the listener or the reader, what the sentence is about, then if we introduce further information, there's a greater chance they'll understand the further information. So here it is, the court decision is the subject. Depend is the verb, judge's interpretation is the object. And then we understand what clause for the contract, why it's relevant in the, in the sentence. Now this is a very short sentence. Try to keep the subject and the main verb together and try to put them at the beginning of the sentence. Try to keep the object as close to them as possible as well and try to keep all of them at the beginning of the sentence. 
let all the other words and information come at the end. Any extra information will now be understood better. Let's have a look at a longer sentence using the same idea. Court decision will depend upon the judge's interpretation of clause four of the contract and now the rest of the information as this section deals with the payments which are still owing. Now we understand why the, re the reference to this section. Obviously, we're talking about clause four. And why are we even talking about clause four? Well, because we know that the court decision depends upon the judge's interpretation of it. If I change the order of the information around, it would be difficult to follow. If I said something like, the section dealing with the payments which are still owing will affect the judge's interpretation of clause four and the court decision. Well, can anybody follow that? Of course you can't. Much too complex. Keep it short, keep it simple, and keep it in the active voice. Now you can use this in ordinary writing, and you can even use it in contract drafting. For example, here's a simple enough little sentence from a contract. The supplier, well, that's the subject, isn't it? Will provide, well, that's the main verb. And what will the supplier provide? Provide vehicles. Now that's an independent clause. It could stand alone as a sentence on its own. The supplier will provide vehicles. However, we're going to add some dependent clauses to it. And we're going to extend it somewhat. So we started off with subject, verb, object. The supplier will provide vehicles which are suitable for the purchaser's requirements, which will be found in the list of requirements contained in Schedule 2 of this contract. Well, it's not too complicated, but when you're writing a contract, you only want to express one idea per sentence. The purpose of a contract is not to provide smooth legal writing whereby you explain ideas as you go through the text. The purpose of a contract is to impose obligations. And to make sure the obligations are understood, you should just impose them one by one. So it's better if we split this sentence into two sentences, each with a subject, verb, object structure, like this. The supplier will provide vehicles which are suitable for the purchaser's requirements. Full stop. Second idea. These requirements, that's the subject, will be found, that's the verb, in the list, object. And where's this list? That comes in the rest of the information. It's contained in Schedule 2 of this contract. These requirements will be found in the list contained in Schedule 2 of this contract. Okay. So, just to remind you, the subject is the doer, the thing or the person doing something. The main verb is what they are doing. And the object is who or what they're doing it to. Now, you will know that in many sentences, there's more than one verb. Which is the main verb, then? Well, the main verb is the one that you choose as the editor of your own writing, as the one that best describes the action. For example, John kicked the ball. Right, there's only one verb, kicked. So John is the subject, kicked must come immediately afterwards. John kicked the ball. But what if I said, John kicked the ball so hard that it flew up through the air, breaking the headmaster's window, and smashing his favourite vase. Well, now we've got four verbs. Kicked, flew, breaking, and smashing. Which is the main verb? Well, it, it depends on what the purpose of the sentence is. If the purpose is to tell you what happened, then it's best to use the chronological sequence. It's always best when telling a story to start off with what happened first, then what happened second, and what happened third, etc. So what happened first? Well, it all flowed from John kicking the ball. So kicked, even in that longer sentence, is still the main verb. Now you can use this subject verb object even in contracts. Just remember, keep the subject and the verb and the object as close as possible together. Let them at the beginning of the sentence, let all the other words, the amplifiers, the modifiers, the phrases, let all the other information come later. Now, here's a long sentence from the contract employment for a director of a company. When it refers to board, it means the board of directors. Now, I've taken all the punctuation out. 
the common law judges would be very annoyed with me for doing this. Punctuation is not a luxury. It's an essential guide to the meaning of the sentence, as we'll see in later lessons. But I know where the punctuation should be. So I'm going to read it as if the punctuation was there. And then I'm going to rewrite it. And you tell me which is the easier text to understand. It says, if any member of the board retires, the company at the discretion of the board, and after notice from the chairman of the board, to all the members of the board, at least 30 days before ex executing this option may buy, and the retiring member must sell the member's interest in the company. Right. Now, there's a style of writing which we're going to look at in this course, if we have time, called left-right writing. In other words, basically, you tell them what they're going to read about, and then you write about it. You express the initial idea at the beginning of your paragraph or clause, and then you tell them all about how it works. So what's the main message in this lengthy sentence? Well, it is that the main message is the company may buy a retiring member's interest. And all the rest of the words, well, that's note, that's information about how you do it. First of all, it's at the discretion of the board. There has to be notice from the chairman of the board. There's got to be at least 30 days notice. And if the option is exercised, the retiring member must sell their interest. Well, you know that you're a member of a company by the ownership of a share or shares in the company. So presumably, this is saying the director must sell their shares in the company back to the company. A frequently used condition in the contract of employment of a director. So let's rewrite it using the subject verb object sequence. Now, we know what the main message is using that left-right style of writing. Here's the sentence again. The company, that's the subject, may buy, that's the verb. Retiring member's interest, that's a multi-word noun. Subject, verb, object. Next, the decision, subject, is, that's the main verb, at the option, object, the option of the board. Next, the chairman, subject must give notice, verb, to all board members, object, and then the rest of the information coming in afterwards. When must this notice be given? Well, at least 30 days before the purchase. And finally, the retiring member, that's the subject, must sell, verb, the option is exercised. Now, which is the easier text to follow? Because they both have exactly the same legal effect. This four sentence, version or this one verse sentence version it's the four sentence version that's easier to follow isn't it because we're breaking up the information into bite-sized pieces that the reader's brain can take in so whenever you're writing anything always ask yourself two questions one can the reader understand this put yourself in the reader's position if the reader is a lawyer, you can use a lot of technical information and they may understand. If the reader is not a lawyer, then don't use so much technical information. But the second question you must ask is, how can I help the reader understand? And usually the answer is, keep the sentences short and use the subject, verb, object, or active voice sequence. All right, let me have a look at some of your comments. Got it, thank you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, as you say, Emma, uh, you're a member of a company by the ownership of a share. You may own one share, you may own a million shares. But the simple fact is everybody who owns a share in a company is technically a member of the company. You own a tiny percentage of it by your ownership of that share. Right, let's move on to another little exercise, shall we? Now, we want to use the active voice. So what we've got here, I'm not going to ask you to go through this full exercise change the sentences that are passive to active. What I want you to do is, first of all, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six sentences. Right, let's have a look at sentence number five. Can you rewrite, it's in the passive voice. Can you rewrite it in the active voice? Very good, let's have a look at some of your answers. That's it, the clerk read the verdict. The clerk read the verdict, everybody seems to have got that. Yeah, very good, Eamon, very good, Olga. Use a definite article because there's only one clerk, so it's a unique person, so it's the clerk. Good. 
the clerk, very good, Daira. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, Shaza, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very good. What's your, what's your spelling, of course? Very good, Amma. All right, that's dead easy. Now, much more difficult. Your lawyers. I want you to use your knowledge of the law to answer number one. When I say use your answer of the law, let's look at the sentence. An answer must be filed within 20 days after the filing of the complaint. That's fine. But in order to identify the subject, we have to know who will it be that files an answer? Who files an answer to a complaint? Presumably the complainant issues the complaint. So who is it that files an answer to it? So that's going to be your subject. Let's just, just, to, <laughs> just, just to remind everybody, please mute your microphone so we don't hear you. Okay. So again, just uh, answer sentence number one. Don't forget, start with the subject. Use your knowledge of the law to work out who it would be that would write that answer to file it. Right, let's have a look at these answers. How many have we got now? Oh, 18, that's plenty. The respondent, absolutely right, amen. Well, now, uh, Salim, th this isn't really the active voice. This is the passive. We want to say who's going to do it. And as Amy pointed out, it's the respondent that's going to do it. Or Ben, we have to file an answer. Okay, we have to do it then. Good. Uh, defendant or respondent, it'll be defendant or respondent while you're quite right. So the defendant or the respondent must file an answer. The respondent, very good, HP. Very good, Nina. Very good, Guyi san Great. Obviously, this is the first lesson. I hope this isn't too basic for all of you. Let's move on. Now, let me just escape from here for a moment. I want to show you something. I've taken some of these questions from our different courses. This, that last exercise was from our legal writing course. Let me just show it to you. The legal writing course, in fact, consists of 60, 15 one-hour lessons or 60 little short video lessons, followed by interactive exercises. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because you can go to our website and you can order a free trial course for any of our lessons. There we are, free trial. We add it to the shopping cart. There it is. Okay. There's the order, and now you click that order button. Or if you wanted to, you could go to, uh, let me see, Contract Law Course. There we are. There's a list of all the lessons. If you wanted to, you can order a free trial lesson. Interesting. The, um, the computer is reacting to the background noise. Very interesting. Okay. And there we are. You order the free trial lesson, and you just click the order button. Let me also show you something else before the lesson, before I go to the last topic. On our website, you can test your English here. Click that test your English button at the top of the page, and you can take this lengthy test of your general English ability, or you can take this free legal vocabulary test. If you click on the button here, you get taken to the, uh, you enter your name and address here, etc., email address, and then you're asked a large number of questions and 77 questions, and the computer marks your answers and sends you a report on where you're strong, where you're weak, etc. Right, let's go back to our lesson. Let's bring up the presentation again. Now, legal vocabulary. Uh, we're going to start off with something really easy. We're going to start off with what are known as false friends, or rather problem words. These are some of the basic, essential, legal English words, which cause problems for people because they sound like other words or they're spelt like other words or they're close to other words. Now, the problem is legal English derives from the Latin, the Norman French, Anglo-Saxon and Jute, as well as ancient Norse from the Vikings. Because we got these four different linguistic traditions built in to legal English, it's very difficult. And even some ordinary English words are given special meanings in the legal English. For example, consideration normally means thinking kindly about people. But anybody who studied contract law knows that consideration means a thing of commercial value that passes between the parties. 
may, right? Buy a lottery ticket, you may be lucky. That's what it means in ordinary English. But in legal English, may means has the power to. The tenant may assign the lease after two years, means the tenant has the power to. Nothing to do with possibility or probability. Now we're going to look at some problem words. We're going to look at plenty of these in the course. Only. Well, <laughs> I advise you not to use this word because it's got four different meanings. It's not a good word to use if you're trying to be precise. It can mean nothing or no one else, such as uh, only qualified lawyers are able to draft these documents. It can also mean with the negative result that, for example, he turned only to find his path was blocked, meaning the negative result that his path was blocked. A further meaning is no longer ago than a particular point in time. For example, it was only on Thursday that the document arrived. And lastly, it can mean not until. For example, we can finalize the contract only when the document arrives. So if I wrote only to you, which of the four meanings do I mean? You'd have to read the entire sentence to try and guess at the meaning. Best really to try and not use it. Also, the positioning of only in the sentence is critical. The meaning of the whole sentence can change depending upon where it's positioned. Generally, it should go immediately in front of the word or phrase that it's qualifying. For example, the only cows are seen on the northern plain. That has a different meaning to the cows are only seen on the northern plain, which in turn has a different meaning the cows are seen on only the northern plain. Very difficult word. I suggest you don't use it. Fewer or less. Well, these words are used incorrectly even by native speakers of English. Fewer should only be used with plural nouns, as in uh, eat fewer cakes, or there are fewer people here today. Plural nouns, cakes, people. Less is used with non-countable nouns. Milk, money, education, intelligence. They're non-countable nouns. So, there is less blossom on this tree. Now, it would be wrong to use the word less with a plural noun. I want to eat less cakes. No, no, no. I want to eat fewer cakes. Okay? That causes problems. And it's obvious from people's mistakes when making it that they're not native speakers of English. And I want you to write well, I want you to write like native speakers. Can or may. Now, can, they're both modal verbs. Their meaning is very close, but it's different. Can is mainly used to mean to be able to. For example, can he move? Can you swim? Can you drive a car? Meaning, do you have the ability to do it? Right. Can he move? Means, does he have the ability, the physical ability to move his arms and legs? Can he move? Whereas may is often used as a modal verb to ask permission. May we leave now? Or it's very hot in here. May I open a window? May tends to be used when asking permission. You look very tired. May I get you a cup of tea? Next, imply or infer. Don't mix them up. They describe the same situation, but from different points of view. If a speaker or a writer implies something as he implied that the manager was a fool, means he suggested it, but he didn't say it directly. He suggested, he, he just said only, uh, only a stupid person would have agreed to this. That doesn't mean I'm saying the manager is a fool. It just, it's that I know the manager was the one who agreed to it. I'm implying it. Whereas inferring it means somebody understands from what I have said. It's not me saying it now, it's what somebody else has understood from what I've said. We inferred from his words that the manager is a fool. It means that whatever I said, you came to the conclusion, this is what I want words really meant. Non or un. Now, these two prefixes both mean not. 
were not something. He's uneducated, means he hasn't got education. But they tend to be used in slightly different ways. Non is more neutral in meaning. And so for lawyers, it's probably a better word than the slightly critical un, which means the opposite. And it means a particular bias or standpoint. For example, unnatural means that something is not natural, but in a bad way. His unnatural behavior means, wow, something's very wrong. Whereas non-natural just means not natural. It doesn't mean any sort of criticism. It's just, it's not the way it normally works. As a consequence, when you've got a general genuine choice as to which you to use always stick to non because it's not critical in any way it's just saying it's not the usual way it's done non-statutory as opposed to unstatutory and if or whether they mean close to the same but it's always better to use the word whether rather than if especially in writing I'll see whether he left an address rather than I'll see even if he left an address. Which is slightly confusing. Do you mean if he provided a, a written address somewhere for us to find or he moved out of the place where he was staying? He left. Which has several meanings. Whether just means if. Only one meaning. Whether is slightly more formal and because that is better for written legal correspondence. It's not overly formal. But it's nicely formal. If is much easier in conversation. If I go to the cinema, I shall want to buy Coca-Cola. Now, notice, by the way, the different spelling between weather, W-H, meaning possibility, and weather, like sunshine or rain. Same pronunciation, different meaning, different spelling. Don't mix them up. And especially or especially. Although especially and especially can both mean particularly, they're not exactly the same. Especially means in particular, chiefly, as in he distrusted them all, especially Karen. Well, especially also means for a special purpose, as in the machine was specially built for this job. Right, well, now we'll stop there for today. There's a few more, but we'll finish for today because we're running out of time. Now, uh, let me stop the sharing. Now, <laughs> the, thank you, those of you who muted your microphones. I'm very grateful. Now's the time. We've overrun time by a little bit, I'm afraid. I'm going to paste a link to this, the recording of this broadcast on the same page where you registered for the lesson. We'll have another lesson on Thursday. We'll again dip into our different courses to take bits and pieces. If you want a specific course on legal writing, go to the legal writing page. If you want a specific course on contract drafting, discounts on all these courses during this period of the coronavirus anyway. But we'll continue to dip into these courses to take three or four lessons from each one. I will paste the recording on the same page that you found the registration. And I'll also try to upload the recording into our YouTube channel so you can watch it there as well. Thank you for your, oh, well, thank you very for your nice comments. Thank you, PMT. Thank you, Apple Zhang. Thank you, Amma. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Amma. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Ben. Well, thank you, everyone. Tell your friends. I'll be frankly, I want to test the system. We had 100 participants. That's great. Let's see if we can get 200 by the end of next week. Tell your colleagues if you enjoyed the lesson, uh, and it's free for them as well. But, you know, tell everybody, just keep your microphone switched off or keep the background noise to a minimum. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure to meet you. Let me switch my uh, camera on so I can wave at everybody. Well, thanks very much, everyone, from sunny Dubai. See you soon. See you Friday. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Adriana. Thanks.